Excellent. Welcome, YouTube. Um, and welcome back, Catherine E. Stang. Um, she's back for a second month in a row. I really, really enjoyed her talk last month. Um, and so I think the fact that there was more was a feature, not a bug. I'm very glad you didn't get through it all. Um, so Catherine E. Stang um, is a professor of mathematics at the University of Colorado Boulder and broadly speaking works in number theory, arithmetic geometry, Kleinian groups, abelian varieties, cryptography, arithmetic dynamics, mathematical illustration, um, all sorts of different kinds of areas. She's earned wide recognition, is a fellow of the Association for Women in Mathematics and a winner at this year's Summer of Math Exposition with her video Rethinking the Reels and her YouTube channel Proof of Concept is pushing almost 8,000 subscribers. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited to hear more. Um, so uh, I don't think last week's talk, month's talk was a prerequisite, but uh, now we'll have both of them on YouTube. So I will pass the floor over to Dr. Stang. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for um, uh, maybe in insanely inviting me back. Um, okay, so let me share a screen. And there we go. So let me know if that's working okay. Um, okay, so uh, so this is the same slide deck, um, slightly modified, and this title page is in the middle of the slide deck. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking in terms of the number of slides that I had last time. Um, but yeah, I had arranged, I had sort of organized it around three, uh, sorry, four um, sort of stories about the use of illustration in research and the interaction between illustration and research. And I got through about two of them. So now there's two more um, and they're fairly separate. So yeah, no, no requirement to have seen the first part. Um, okay. So beauty is truth, truth, beauty. So I think this has special meaning to mathematicians. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's apt to the next project. So maybe I'll come back to why. Okay. There we go. So this project came out of a special semester that uh, actually Gabe mentioned earlier about um, illustrating mathematics held at ISERM in fall 2019. And um, my collaborators are uh, Edmund Harris in the upper left here and Steve Treadle in the lower right. You can also see some pictures of my children and of my uh, co-organizers of the semester. You probably can't tell the difference. Um, and all of the beautiful things that were that were there. Um, so it was a it was a fantastic experience just to have all of the interaction between things. And so that'll sort of come up in this story. So what I want to do is uh, reorganize the story, not quite in the historical direction, but in the sort of um, thought process of how one figures out how to, to illustrate things. Um, so imagine that I ask you, what does it look like if we look in the complex plane and we try to plot every root of a quadratic polynomial with coefficients in Q. So every quadratic irrational in the complex plane. Well, you probably know these things are, are dense. And so if I really plotted all of them, it would look like this. It would be a solid black square or you know infinite plane. Um, and so the question is, how can you tease out the structure which you expect might be present in the structure, you know, the distribution of these points in the complex plane? Um, so how might you figure out a nice way to draw a picture of this? And one thing that you might think to do is to just start trying to actually plot them. Um, so imagine that you uh, that you decide to do the simplest possible Python program, and you just go through maybe as a as a loop the possible coefficients of your polynomials, and then you plot the roots. Okay. So here's what happens if you do that. So here you can actually see the simplest possible code. This is in Sage. And I'm just going through A, B, and C. I'm making the polynomial AX squared plus BX plus C and then plotting the roots. And because the computer has to finish at some point, I made it only go through A, B, and C up to 10. But you can see now that there's really something going on, right? There's some structure to these roots. So what is it that we're capturing? We're actually capturing something that you might think of as kind of dynamic, which is that if you add these points to the plane in a particular order, you're going to see things happening. Once you finished, you've got a black screen. Before you started, you had a white screen. But as you go, if you decide to fill out in a sort of box of coefficients for the polynomials that you're taking roots of, then you do see structure and you see something really interesting going on. 
Another way to capture um, this, so one way is you could turn this into an animation. Um, I haven't actually tried doing this, but I think this would be pretty cool. Just let the box grow and draw the dots, just this picture, but for you know 10 and then for 20 and then for 30 and so on and watch it fill in. Um, another way you can do it without having to animate would be to make the dots uh, somehow capture how, you know, the, their time of appearance in the plane. So how simple was the polynomial that they are a root of? So what you could do is you could scale the size of the dot based on the size of the coefficients of the polynomial so that when you have a simple polynomial, something which is sort of arithmetically or number theoretically simple, you could plot a big dot because that's an important point. And then for the later ones, you could plot little dots that are gradually filling in the background in some sense, right? And so there's a way of capturing um, what's happening. So here's what happens if you do that. So naive height here is a way of measuring the arithmetic complexity and it's just asking how big are the coefficients. So this is essentially the larger dots on here are just the polynomials with smaller coefficients, maybe in max of the coefficients or something like that. Um, okay, and so then you start to see that there really is a lot of interesting structure going on here. You see more than you did in the previous picture because of the sizing. And you can see symmetries, right? There's clearly some sort of symmetry going on in this picture, but it's fading off to the sides. Um, and so then you might start playing with this and think about other sizings on the dots that would bring out different aspects. And it turns out that a natural sizing would be to take not the maximum of the coefficients of your quadratic polynomial, but the discriminant of the quadratic polynomial. And if you do that, you get this picture. Is it going? There it's going. <laughs> Um, and now you've sort of uh, fully captured the symmetry. I should point out that the fact that it's sort of sparser off to the left and the right here is a, is a figment of the, uh, the programming. Um, it should really actually be symmetric under translation. It's just that I've actually plotted more detail towards the middle of the picture. All right. And so, um, so now you look at this picture and you start to wonder all kinds of natural questions about quadratic numbers, right? So it looks like there's these lines. What do those represent? It looks kind of like there's something three-dimensional going on. How How is that occurring? Is there actually some three-dimensional object that this is a picture of in some way? Um, I think there's a lot of things that your brain suggests because it's designed to pick up on um, two and three-dimensional um, visual phenomena. And it's also designed to pick up on like spatial reasoning and stuff. So um, so this is, you know, the, somehow I think of the the goal, and hopefully I'll remember to come back to this, but somehow I think of the goal of these visualization exercises with, with how do you visualize a mathematical object so that you get interesting information out of it and so that the visualization is actually tied to the meaning, to the mathematics going on. Um, there's lots of ways to answer that. One thing is, you know, one way, um, which the fourth story is actually a little closer to, is to start with the mathematical thing that you want to capture and figure out how to um, how to harness the human visual system to attach your visual intuition to that feature, that mathematical feature that you're most interested in about your object. But the other direction, which is more kind of Keats's um, take on things, is that if you just play around and start visualizing and let the beauty of the picture guide what you do, you may discover mathematics you weren't even looking for. So here, by making some of these choices and by trying to um, size the dots so that you do capture the symmetry, for example, you see all sorts of things happening in this picture, which you can then go and ask about. So um, this isn't exactly the order of events that actually happened at ISERM. I was messing around. I think I posted a picture kind of like that one that came out of um, a little bit of Python code there and ask people like, what's this? Oh, it looks kind of like this. It reminds me of that. And, you know, there was just a lot of discussion around these things. Um, and then Edmund um, started plotting some of these uh, in Mathematica. And they're just so, these pictures are just so intriguing. Um, and then we started to try to figure out what is the underlying geometry that's controlling the picture. So we let the picture actually guide us to the questions that we wanted to ask. And what happened, which is very interesting, is that the in the end, we came back around to mathematics that had been done without illustration uh, long ago. So we'll hopefully get to that um, shortly. Okay, so um, so this picture can, there's a sort of simpler case where you can understand what's happening first. 
which is instead of thinking about quadratics in the complex plane, let's think just about rationals inside the real line. So this is a picture in some sense of rationals in the real line. And to explain this picture, I actually want to share a video with you. So I'm gonna bring this up here. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Somebody please tell me if this is not showing on the screen. We can see it. Okay. All right. So what I'm doing right now, that there's a bigger dot in the middle. This is just the um, Z squared lattice viewed from above. Okay. So it's just all of the integer points in the plane and the larger one is the origin. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly descend, and apologies, frame rate's probably not great in Zoom, <laughs> into that origin point and look out from the origin. And then what you see is that the dots from that lattice, which are closer to you, are looking larger. So they are the simpler coordinates, the ones that, whose coordinates are closer to zero. And then the ones who, are, who have more complicated, larger coordinates are smaller dots that you view as being farther away on the horizon. And so you can capture this picture. Go back to the picture I have on the screen here. What this actually is, is I've put a dot at each rational number in the real line, but the dot is sized inversely proportional um, to a power of the denominator. So the integers are the largest because they have the smallest denominators. So you think maybe this is minus one, zero, one, two. And then ha the half integers here are the next largest dots. And the third, the integers with denominator three, one thirds, two thirds, and so on are the, the third largest dots and so on and so forth. And this is actually, depending on how you tune the sizing, like almost literally exactly what you would see from the origin. And so uh, here's a picture, oops. There, okay. Here's a picture um, sort of viewed from above of what's happening. If you're sitting at the origin, so you are this uh, person right here looking out, some of the dots will be hidden by other dots, but the ones that you see will be the ones that are in, um, uh, that have co-prime coordinates that are sort of in lowest terms. And so actually you can think of the rationals, a rational number is a pair of integers, numerator and denominator, as the coordinates of a point in this z squared lattice. And you will see the ones that are in lowest form from the origin, the other ones being hidden behind them because they're multiples. And you'll actually see this, um, this picture. So what is the particular plane if you're projecting it? So what is this picture? What it is, is it's, it really is a picture of something higher dimensional, which has been moved into something lower dimensional. Um, and so there's a sense in which the understanding the structure of the rationals just in the real line um, is really a question of understanding something which is slightly higher dimensional, um, that when we squish it into the real line is really lowering the dimension. Okay, so these pictures that we saw before, uh, let me go back here, this picture, it looks so much, it looks so reminiscent of what I just described for the rationals. You've got these sorts of lines, now they're curved, but they look just like that rational line, but they're going in every which direction. So maybe it's just sort of a higher dimensional version of this. For those of you who are familiar with the upper half plane and hyperbolic geometry, these are looking like geodesics um, of the hyperbolic geometry. And um, they're all crisscrossing and a, you know, a lot of them are connecting at particular big points. So what's going on? So it turns out that playing around um, with what's going on, we were able to sort of figure out what is the geometry behind this. And the story, maybe I'll show you another picture now, is as follows. So first, what I want to do is, oh, yeah, I'll show you in a second. Okay. So first, what I want to do is look at this box on the left. This is the box of coefficients of the polynomial. So my polynomial is like ax squared plus bx plus c. So that's three coefficients, this three-dimensional lattice of possibilities. And I might as well, since I'm taking polynomials that have um, rational coefficients, I might as well scale up the denominator. That's not going to change the roots. And so I can think of this as a Z cubed lattice. These are the integer points in a three-dimensional space. And these represent quadratic polynomials. And then it turns out that this is the lattice that you're seeing in that picture. And the transformation is that you look inside, you project down towards the origin onto a disk. And then that disk opens up into the complex plane. And I'll show you just a animation of that quickly. Oh, it does not work that way. 
this. Ah, wrong thing. Sorry. Controlling my computer. It's a challenge. Okay. And there it is opening up. Um, and so that's the geometry that's happening is first you project a lattice down onto this disc and those lines look straight. And then you open up the disc, like you puncture it at infinity and just spread open the boundary of the disc to create the real line. And you get this, um, this picture that we've been taking a look at. And what are you doing? Well, you're starting with the coefficients, the polynomial that you're given. And at the end, you're plotting the roots. So what is this transformation here? It's actually just the quadratic formula. Um, this really is just a way of visualizing what the quadratic formula is doing. Um, and actually, for those of you who are familiar with hyperbolic geometry, this is a model of the hyperbolic plane, the upper half plane. And over here, this is a different model of the hyperbolic plane, this disk inside a cone. And this um, is a hyperbolic isometry, this opening up of the disk to fill the upper half plane is a hyperbolic isometry which is basically just given by the quadratic formula. So by the way, just a note, um, we were fascinated to discover this and we figured, okay, this has got to be written down somewhere, um, but we haven't seen a reference that, uh, that describes the quadratic formula as doing a hyperbolic isometry um, between two models of the hyperbolic plane. So if anybody knows of a reference for that, um, we'd certainly be interested. Okay, so, um, so this is, so now we've discovered some of the geometry that's happening behind this picture Let's see and now you might ask what sorry for the <laughs> flipping now you might ask what happens if you do you know other similar investigations so the first natural thing you might try to do is cubics so here's all the roots of cubics um and um plotted in the plane and i'll do a little detail you can first in this one you might notice that you see these same geodesic lines so they're kind of actually avoiding where the quadratics were with sort of ghosted white area that they're avoiding. Um, here's a detail of that picture, which just shows the complexity, but you do see these same features, these like beaded necklaces, but now they're all curved in interesting ways. And, you know, I think when you look at this, you realize, okay, well, there's got to be, especially knowing what happened in the, the lower dimensional case, the lower degree case, you know, there's gotta be some maybe even higher dimensional um, geometric thing maybe it's still a lattice a lattice of coefficients which is somehow being transformed as you take the roots to get into the plane and it's so uh there's that extra dimension just adds so much complexity and you end up with these these wonderful we started calling these out you know starscapes algebraic number starscapes because you've got like nebula and, and and galaxies and and planets and things going on here looks very dynamic to me um okay so now i want to show you another visualization of this. So this is another quick video. One second. So what this actually is, before I show you the video, um, this is a software which was created by David Dumas. You can find it on his website. And he happened to be at um, the semester there. And he happened for a totally different reason to be trying to illustrate um, point clouds in 3D. And so it's a it's a, um, a visualizer where you can load in a point cloud, uh, a ton of points, and then you can play with it. This is a screencast of me playing with it. So you'll see my mouse on there. So you can zoom in and you can start to rotate it. You can see that, um, I won't tell you what this picture is quite yet, an interesting structured looking point cloud that's sort of sitting inside a torus. And you can see it has sort of um, uh, hyperplanes of some kind or hypersurfaces. Um, it seems to have these beaded necklaces again, and you can get this three-dimensional uh, sense from it. So this is all available, by the way. This project has a website and you can download this data, all these points, and you can upload it into the viewer and, and do this yourself. Um, okay, so what was it that we were just looking at? This is the cubics again. And what I'm doing oops, is let's take a cubic polynomial. So AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D. And if it's going to have a root in the complex plane, then it's the kind of cubic polynomial which has two complex conjugate roots and one real root, because there's only a few options here, right? So that's the kind of thing that will have a complex root. And so what you can do is you can imagine thinking of the real line 
as going out in one direction. What I'm going to do is I'm imagining my real line as a tube, a big long uh, tube. Maybe it's a cucumber or a, or a log or something like that, since there seems to be a saw going on in the screen. Okay, so this is your big long tube, and it goes to plus infinity and minus infinity. That's the real number line. And at each choice of r, I take a slice. That's what this guy is doing with his with his saw. He's taking a slice. So by fixing r, I fix a slice. This is the r equals zero slice. And then I look at what are the um, the possible uh, complex roots when r, for all the polynomials for which r is zero. And then I get um, a little picture here. And remember before we had a model of the upper half plane came from a disk model. And so this is the disk model. And then if this guy over here pierces the boundary and opens it up to become the real line, then you will get a copy of the upper half plane. And so what's happening is that we have sort of um, a way of thinking about all of the roots of the cubics in a higher dimensional, like a, a higher dimensional way to separate them out so that they don't look quite so complicated when they're all overlaid onto one single complex plane, is to sort of break them into these individual slices, which are individual copies of the, um, the complex plane. So this tube, if I connect plus and minus infinity, becomes a donut, and that's what we were seeing in the last um, picture. And there, because we upped the dimension, we could separate those points and see what's really happening. And it does look kind of lattice-like again. And so here is a nice slice. This is like a um, this is a family here where I picked ax cubed plus bx squared plus ax plus c, where a and a is repeated here. So this is a lower dimensional family within the whole thing. And you can load this also and play with it and turn it around. And it's a hypersurface inside that um, that donut, which is actually a Mobius strip if you um, if you follow it around. And you can see that in one slice like this, you have the same structure that we were seeing, say, in the quadratics. OK, so um, so part of the project, what we did was we looked at uh, what was the um, we looked at the uh, you know, what is the geometry that's controlling this? And we could kind of get to cubics, but then um, beyond that, it gets more and more complicated and it's it's not at all clear how to do this. Um, but it's very interesting to try to pull that apart. Um, another thing that happened in that project, and I'll just show you some more pictures while I tell you a little bit about it, is that when you look at these pictures, you notice a phenomenon here, which is that these points, um, they the larger points tend to repel one another. You won't see larger points overlapping or being really close to each other. Um, you have to be very small if you're going to be very close to each other. And so this is kind of saying in some sense that and these are just different families of polynomials here for you to enjoy. This is saying in some sense that um, uh, that points which have a low arithmetic complexity, so they're not very complicated points from the point of view of the arithmetic, they have a simple equation that they're a root of, um, those repel one another in the plane. And so you can ask this question of how close can I get to a particular point that I might be interested in with how, how well can I approximate it by points chosen from my family, like cubics or quadratics, um, uh, in terms of the simplicity. So can I get very close with a simple one or do I need, if I want to approximate some particular point of interest, do I am I forced to go to more and more complicated points to get close? And that actually is the classical study of Diophantine approximation, which you could imagine being rediscovered just by looking at these pictures. And so what we did is we played with some of these pictures and um, and took we we as a sort of experiment we let the uh, the, the the illustration guide the research in the sense that um, instead of reproving the classical theorems which have been proven before computers without the illustration so much. Um, we decided to figure out what the pictures were saying. And because the pictures uh, tended, especially in the quadratic case, we were looking at the quadratic case, they picked up this hyperbolic geometry. We ended up producing statements which were similar to the classical statements, but were stated in terms of hyperbolic geometry and in terms of the discriminant sizing, instead of the naive arithmetic sizing and the usual complex norm distance. Um, and so what was done classically was motivated by those which seemed like the simplest choices, but the illustration seemed to say, try to do this with hyperbolic geometry and try to do it with the discriminant. And turns out you get very many of the same or very similar um, statements. So we reproved, um, shouldn't really say reproved because they're slightly different statements, but proved very similar statements in sort of a, a different context. So it's sort of an experiment um, in letting the illustration guide the research. So there's all sorts of questions that you might ask and looking at these starscapes, there's all kinds of interesting phenomena 
happening. You might even ask about how these lines that are in here are repelling one another instead of the points. Um, these ones, so they have these denser regions in here. Um, and I don't know what that's indicating. That's pretty fascinating. There's all kinds of interesting things. Um, all right. And at the end, I just wanted to uh, to say thank you to to Gabe, who with one of his students took this project a little bit farther and started asking about the Galois properties of these roots and did some um, plots of their own, separating out points according to their behavior in terms of the Galois group of the polynomial. Um, and I noticed actually that Gabe has one of these pictures up on his wall uh, right now in his video there. <laughs> I think that is right. And um, yeah, so uh, so he's drawn these beautiful pictures and I like the aesthetic choice here of making it black. So they're really more like starscapes uh, glowing in the night sky somehow. All right, so, um, okay. So last story to the extent that I have any time left. Um, <laughs> So here's a quote from William Thurston, and it just speaks for itself. So we humans have a wide range of abilities that help us perceive and analyze mathematical content. We perceive abstract notions, not just through seeing, but also by hearing, by feeling, by our sense of body motion and position. Our geometric and spatial, spatial skills are highly trainable, just as in other high performance activities. And in mathematics, we can use the modules of our minds in flexible ways, even metaphorically. A whole mind approach to mathematical thinking is vastly more effective than the common approach that manipulates only symbols. So this really speaks to me, this, this idea that um, if we understand what our brains are good at um, and try to exploit that, try to connect that to what it is that we want to understand in mathematics, then we can create good visualizations that can help us understand things. So um, that includes the visual uh, things, but also he mentions even metaphorically here, it also includes things like social reasoning. I mean, we are very good at um, thinking about fairness in a social context, about thinking about characters and narratives and stories. And I think there's situations where we use that, like a good proof, if you think about what constitutes a good proof, it usually one of the ways that it can be a good proof is it tells a story and you feel like there are characters playing roles and there's a, a narrative arc to the proof where you're expecting a certain kind of thing to happen because it's sort of dictated by the characters in the story. And I think those are ways in which we're, we're harnessing these aspects of our minds. Um, and one of the main ones is just how can we use our visual system because that's such a huge uh, piece of what our brains are good at. Okay, so I wanna tell you that with the last a little bit of time here about um, a project that first came out of the Experimental Math Lab at CU Boulder. And this is part of a larger collection of um, labs that are connected through Geometry Labs United. And they have a sort of wider mandate. They want to get undergraduates involved in research, but they're very, this is a very like wide, broad idea of what it means to be involved in mathematics. So there's experimentation, computer visualization, um, research, but also pedagogy and outreach. Um, here's a team of students that I was working with and, and they were 3D printing some tori with bumps on them of different kinds representing functions and stuff. So those ended up displayed in the, the library here. Okay, so what I'm interested in, think of this again as a thought experiment, um, but now we're starting with the math side. So the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. So if you're a number theorist, you think about numbers, the simplest kind of thing that you could study is a sequence of integers. Um, it's sort of like there's so many sequences of integers, they show up in all areas of mathematics, they mean all kinds of different things, they have all kinds of different mathematical properties. And wonderfully, they are stored in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, which if you have never visited, you should definitely visit. It used to be a book, now it's an online encyclopedia. You can enter some, some numbers in order and say, do I want them consecutive or like they allowed to be spread out? And then it'll find all the sequences that those appear in that order. It's, um, it's lovely, but when you find an entry, it's text. You can look at the sequences. They're listed in their decimal expansions, the individual terms. Um, you can find uh, connections like um, links and citations to all of the pieces of mathematics involved. You can find formulas and stuff like that, but it's the entries are text. And so the question is, can you, can you visualize integer sequences? And it's a hard question because there isn't that much structure. It's not like a geometric object to begin with. How can you use our visual system to interact with integer sequences? 
So one thing that exists um, is the OEIS movie, which you can find on YouTube. And it's wonderful, just shows graphs. Graphs are like one of the first ways that we uh, might interact with a function and a sequence is a function on its indices. So we have indices on the x-axis and values of the sequence on the y-axis. And this is a fun video to watch. I encourage you to go and watch this. The variety is amazing. The structure is fascinating. There's all kinds of different um, things that you pick up. But there might be many other ways of visualizing sequences as well. So, um, so here's the, the dream. So we wanna build a web tool. Um, we're actively working on this. So we want a tool that can take your favorite sequence. So maybe it's as easy as just putting in the OEIS number. Um, so the reference to it in the encyclopedia with some kind of visualization tool like graph of the sequence. And I want it to be so uh, appealing and interactive like that Cayley graph visualizer that we saw earlier, like it's beautiful the way that it's drawing the um, the, the Cayley graphs is artistic. I want it to be so appealing that way and the user interface so uh, seamless that people will play with it even if they don't know, even if they're not coming to it already as, as math researchers or mathematicians. And I want it to be extensible so people can add to it and create visualizers without it being complicated. And so these are people who've been involved so far. These are largely students through um, the University of Colorado here. And um, Glenn Whitney and I are now co-directors of this project. And I would encourage you if you want to get involved, that would be fantastic. Um, we need people to contribute. Okay, so let me just give you a couple of examples. Okay, I'll just end with a few examples. So what might we want to visualize? Um, so what properties of the sequence could you capture? Well, depending on what the sequence represents, it might have very varied properties. I mean, you could be interested just in its growth rate. You could be interested in its divisibility properties, what primes divide it or whether the terms divide each other. Um, a lot of interesting sequences have self-similarity of some kind. Um, can, that should definitely be something you could pick up. You know, if it has a fractal nature, you should be able to see this. Um, just statistics of the sequence. Um, Looking at the sequence mod p, how does it behave? Um, these are all things that a number theorist or a mathematician in other areas might want to know about the sequence. And the interesting exercise is to take one of these and think, how can I create a visualizer which will harness the human visual system to pick up on those properties? So that when I input different sequences, I will just see if they have, or, or what kind of properties they have with respect to some type of property like this. So here's a, a simple example. This is one. Um, well, we'll see what it tells you about the sequence. So the idea is turn your sequence into instructions for a turtle. Many of you may have played with these in school at some point, at least if you're my age. <laughs> and so maybe you take your sequence mod two. So it's a sequence of zeros and ones, turn it into basically a word in some alphabet. And then you interpret the zeros and ones or whatever your alphabet is as, um, as instructions. So maybe it's turn some number of degrees and take a step, okay? Here's an example. Um, and so you can play with these um, if you take, well, I'll put up the slides so that you can uh, look at these and you can use these uh, example visualizers on the website. I can put a link in Discord afterwards. Um, so this is the Hofstadter figure figure sequence. There's the beginning of it at the top there. And um, I've just taken it mod three and then interpreted it as some, uh, some instructions. And what do you see? So the color is changing gradually through the rainbow from beginning to end of the, the segment of the sequence that I'm graphing. And so you can see that the behavior is changing over time. And also that it has little periods of doing one kind of thing, and then it'll switch out of that kind of behavior and start doing something else for a while, right? It's making little circles for a while, and then it switches into some sort of pattern that, that ends up with big circles, and then it switches again. And how, you know, maybe the distance between those switches is changing over time, because at the beginning of this, you can see, you know, it didn't, it switched pretty quickly to a different behavior, but over here it's staying in the same behavior much longer, it looks like. So these are things that, that you pick up about the sequence that maybe you weren't even looking for, but this picks up. Here's a few other examples. Here's the two attic valuation of the integers. Um, so this has a sort of fractal structure to it. And it's just, that's just pretty. I mean, I just, it's, it's beautiful. Um, here's another one that has this sort of, um, gradually changing behavior, but some sort of repetition and then switch and then repetition. Here's the Tweemore sequence, which you know is associated to the Cox snowflake if you've come across it before. So it actually will draw that if you choose the right um, turtle things. Here's the continue fraction of pi. And I like this one because no matter how you play with it in terms of trying to interpret it as a turtle walk, you can't get anything that doesn't look kind of just random. Um, and that's because the sequence is mysterious. 
Um, but what's interesting about it is there are known statistics about continued fraction expansions that, you know, you're more likely to get ones and then less likely to get twos. And so that ends up with my choice of um, things here. You sort of see these sort of arcing things that you can tell this is pretty unpredictable. Um, if it was patternful, like the two addicts or something, you would be like, wow, I discovered the secret to pi. Um, okay, now I want to give you, uh, I don't know how many more minutes I'm allowed here, but I want to give you um, another one. Okay, so this one is a little more systematic in a way. So in this one, what I've done is I'm I'm going to take the pixels on the screen as a grid. Each column is headed by a term of the sequence. So A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. And then the first row is just the sequence itself. The second one is the translation of that sequence. So I've just moved the whole array of pixels to the left one notch, okay? And then two notches, the next line down and so on. So now if I interested in what am I going to do with this pixel here? What I want to do with this pixel is I want to compare, so this pixel is A5, to the column header A3. So it's been shifted by two. So I'm comparing A5 to the thing which came two notches earlier in the sequence. And then what does compare mean? Well, it could mean lots of different things. It could mean the distance between those. So just this is something about the growth rate of the sequence. It could be, do they have a big GCD? Something about the divisibility of the sequence. Or maybe like, you know, how different are the, the number of times a particular prime divides them? So you could interpret this very many ways. You could also decide to, instead of just um, changing the sequence by a translation at each row, you could maybe dilate it um, and translate it, different, you know, some sort of linear transformation. But basically at root, what it is is you're comparing the column header to the entry and you're asking how close are they in some way. And what you wanna do is pick up, does the sequence have any type of self-similarity, some reference to itself? maybe at some other point in the sequence. Okay, so let's see what some of these look like. So here's the integers, and this is just under distance similarity. So the integers are very similar to themselves, pretty similar to the integer coming um, one after, two after, three after, and eventually, you know, not so much. So this isn't very perhaps enlightening. Here, just to help you understand what's happening in the picture, are the integers with a modulus, so this is mod 38. So after 38 lines, you'll come back and be the same again. So you see these bars. And so this is something kind of, if you work mod 38, it's kind of something about how it's moving around that mod 38 clock, like the speed or something, something about growth rate. Here's the prime numbers done the same way, mod 38. So this is kind of interesting because you do see something similar to the previous um, slide. So that's something about the growth rate, but it's irregular telling you that you know the primes are a little irregular, even though they have a growth rate. And then you see some other stuff that you start to wonder about, like there's definitely diagonal lines and some vertical lines. And if you spend a little time thinking about this, you realize, well, okay, so sometimes there's these like larger prime gaps and those will kind of create fractures in this picture. But your mind, the, the point is that your brain just picks up visually on something, which you might not have even thought to look for. And then, um, and then you can go ask what mathematically is explaining that feature. Um, here's the squares mod 48. So they have this nice, these are actually like related to hyperbolas. Um, here's the Hofstadter figure figure sequence. And you can just see from this picture that it looks like it kind of has a quadraticness to it. This is mod 20. Um, so it's telling you something that there's some sort of quadratic growth rate going on. Now here's one where I'm doing divisibility. So I'm asking for the, how big is the GCD? This is just the integers, but these are the integers. And then these are two times the integers. And they're nice and bright because an integer and two times an integer has a big GCD relative to the size of the integer to begin with. And so these are rational slope lines that you see. And so this is a picture of how the integers uh, carry divisibility within themselves. There's some self-similarity because integers which are related by, you know, for example, X and two X, they're gonna be related in terms of their prime factors. Okay, so this is kind of cool. Now, if I do the exact same parameters for the Fibonacci numbers, we get this and I'll just go back and forth. You can see it's really the same picture, just a little paler or something. And this is because the Fibonacci numbers have a divisibility property that if N divides M, then the nth term will divide the mth term. Um, all right, so um, here's some, this is something we might wonder, uh, you know, is this is this uh, actually a pattern? So there's a feature to like jiggle the integers by plus or random plus or minus ones to see if the pattern survives because then it's about growth rate as opposed to about divisibility. 
Um, that's this is just an awesome one that I like. And I think I'm running out of time is my impression. So I'll just say a couple of last words. I had a couple more. Maybe I'll just show you a couple of pictures. This is about um, divisibility of primes within a sequence. And this one is the chaos game, if you've ever heard about this. And this picks up, um, maybe I'll just show you the pictures. This picks up lots of cool uh, properties of different sequences. It's not quite a turtle thing, but it's more kind of a statistical correlation kind of thing that it picks up. And I, I better stop. So mathematics is not merely a matter of understanding, but quite essentially a matter of imagination. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. I can't wait. Are, is, is that um, at the end, I, the nope, is this something we can start playing with like now? Um, yeah, so the, the number scope, um, it's in development. And I have on my website, the ones that I showed on here were standalones that I made and I just entered a bunch of sequences. So they're just like stored in the browser. Um, but we're trying to build a machine that will have a back end, which will talk to the OAIS, factor things for you if you need. Um, and then you can just take any sequences you're interested in and input them into various different visualizers. And you can make a visualizer and then just plug it into the thing and then it'll work with all of these and everybody can play with it. I think one of the things that's really important, um, this is a point I actually like to make, is that, um, that people make these beautiful things, but we need to be sharing them more. Like we need to make them um, adaptable and accessible and documented. And it's, it's hard work and it's not like necessarily the fun part, you know? But uh, but the more that we can make these things that the community can use, um, the better. So I just encourage people to uh, to make whatever you're doing open source on GitHub, well documented. People can um, so people can build on it and so forth. Um, so that's part of the the vision with this is that it could become a platform where it makes it easy for you to do something and then make it available. Great, Aaron. I see you raised your hand. Yeah, I had a question about this. So. For number scope, you have uh, a huge source of sequences, and you have various tools. Um, did you say also that you're imagining, like as part of the dream, that the computer would somehow match a sequence with the tool, so it'd sort of figure out what might look interesting to you? Was that oh, part of no, the? No, I had never even thought about that. Actually, that's a fascinating idea. So the way I think about it is that we're always trying to understand ourselves and make that match. You know, think I think like I think it's a really hard problem. You know, to decide how do I figure out what's the correct way to visualize something to highlight the piece of mathematics that I'm interested in. So how can I connect the kind of mathematics to some sort of visual intuition? Often, um, I think that's really hard. But uh, yeah, that's a fascinating idea that maybe the computer could play with them itself or or guess for you somehow. <laughs> I see. Thanks. Yeah, I wondered. I wondered how you might even approach something like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So it reminds me a little bit about she was showing ask a while ago, where she was talking about like trying to see if if she could use machine learning to figure out what a good mathematical sculpture should look like. Um, oh wow! Yeah. And fascinating. Um, was that know. a very like uh, you know I can imagine a very prescribed like specific, uh, you know, machine learning model for predefined parameters. And I can also imagine something very large scale that's like, you know, just sculpture at large, you know, what does it mean to be a visualization or a sculpture? You know, fascinating questions. Are there any other questions? I've seen a couple of folks typing in Discord. Um, I know it is 102, so, or for me, it's 102. For Jean-Baptiste, it's a lot later. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for hanging around. <laughs> but if anyone has any other questions. Um... If not, the Discord is is running. Um, I think uh, Kate's talk broke the record for most Discord posts in a thread last time. Um, so now we've got a, we've got something to beat. Um, if you didn't scroll through Kate's thread from last month, the the pictures that were posted were astounding, um, and from a bunch of different areas of math. So I encourage you to go take yeah, a look. I loved the connections people made that I didn't know about. Things I learned so much from uh, from people's ideas in there. So yeah, reach out. And if you're interested in getting involved in NumberScope, please uh, contact me. 
Okay, well, maybe, um, maybe I'll just give one more final plug. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. Wonderful presentations, especially thanks to Jean for staying up all night <laughs> to join us. Much appreciated. Um, and uh, remember about the two events coming up. There's an ICERM event in 2025, and there's a there's a uh, uh, Henri Poincaré event in 2026. Um, applications are not open for either of those yet, but the websites um, uh, there's a there's a there's a interest form for the for the later one the 2026 one and there's a website already for the 2025 one so keep an eye out for those and we'll keep reminding you um check out again our youtube channel and the illustrating math uh website and of course um the discord server for many other things thank you again and we'll see you next time <laughs>